Hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 79. Next week we will be revealing the winners of the Armoured Cruiser design competition uh, from the tail end of last year. But before we get to that, while judging is still ongoing, uh, I thought we should announce the next competition, which will be a Treaty Era Cruiser from the early to mid 1930s. So your design period is 1931 to 1935, um, London and naval treaty restrictions are in place, but apart from that, you can pretty much design whatever kind of treaty cruiser you like. Broadly speaking, I'll be judging them in three primary categories. One is heavy cruiser, obviously, so up to 8-inch guns. The next is light cruiser, which is up to 6-inch guns. And then finally, a term that I have decided to call the specialist cruiser. So this, it's fairly likely that everyone for the heavy and light cruisers is going to be pushing the 10,000 ton weight limit. But for the specialist cruisers, these can will be ships, if you fancy designing them, which have a particular role. So something like, say, a Leander class, which was designed for mostly for commerce protection, or an Atlanta or Dido class, which was designed mainly for AA work. Um these kind of things. So those kind of cruisers, for various reasons, probably won't be at the 10,000 ton limit or possibly even anywhere close to it. I mean, we've also got the Arith user class, but the less said about those, the better. Um, so yes, specialist class cruiser, which will allow you to play around a bit more with the cruiser concept in the, co in the context of the early 1930s. So those will be the three categories that I'll be judging primarily, but there will also be a fourth category, and each category will have its own separate prizes and winners. If you really, really want to, then you can design what I call a fleet replacement program. So in the 1930s, there were a lot of navies that had a lot of ships that were holdovers from the First World War, and to varying degrees, they were trying to do wholesale replacements of them. So if you want to, you can design a, sort of a, a two or three ship combo, heavy, light and specialist, or just maybe heavy and light. And those combined designs would be sort of your concept of how a, a fleet, and obviously nominate which country, is going to replace pretty much all its existing cruiser stock as it stands at, in the early 1930s. And obviously with such a big, big building program, some of these ships won't be finished until the late 1930s, which will mean that ships may be built in the mid to late 20s could potentially be retired um, justifiably as a result of this program. Um, I know that's a little bit of a big ask, but it's the treaty era, um, treaty cruisers, so I'm sure there'll be some of you who will probably want to take up the challenge. And if you do, well, it's only fair that I hold a little special section for rewarding the effort. And so today's questions are taken from the video on the RV Petrol, how to pronounce Japanese carrier names, and the R-Class destroyers of World War I. So Galdir Ionai asks, is there any particular reason for the lost bow versus lost stern thing in Rex? Was it differences in construction methods, different local conditions, or just random statistics? So German ships especially in the World War II period, it did have something of a reputation for having the sterns collapse almost at the first breath of damage, as you can see modelled here by the Prince Eugen after it had been torpedoed. Now, the reasons for this sort of perpetual, perpetually collapsing or snapping off or almost failing stern on the German ships, these reasons are quite varied. Um, there's still some discussion over the finer points of it, but... Two of the major points that are consistently raised by many historians is, one, the fact that German welding techniques and designs were not necessarily the best, um, as it does appear that an awful lot of these failures occurred along welded joints. 
Um, that's not to say that the welding was absolutely terrible, um, but there does seem to have been something wrong with either the way that the welds in themselves were designed in the first place, or possibly the quality of the welding. Obviously, the quality of the welding is not going to be the same ship to ship. Um, however, the other thing, which is probably the far larger issue, um, especially on all the capital ships, the Deutschland, um, yeah, the, no, sorry, the Admiral Hippers, the Scharnhorst, and the Bismarcks, is that all of those ships went for the three propeller design as opposed to the four propeller design that you see on most other ships um, of that type in other navies. And if you're going to go for three propellers but you want a similar speed, you have to have individually larger propellers, otherwise you're just going to get cavitation and not go nowhere particularly quickly. If you have larger propellers, that means both the propeller shaft itself has to be seated slightly higher up in the hull to prevent the propellers sticking out beneath the keel, at which point it's, so that's a very good way of tearing up your propellers in shallow water. And if you do that, to so move your propeller shaft upwards and you happen to have large propellers anyway, that means that the overhanging part of your stern must therefore become shallower. Otherwise, the propeller's going to take a chunk out of it, especially that central pro propeller shaft. Uh, well, the propeller on the shaft. Um, and that meant that the Germans' uh, heavy cruisers and capital ship sterns generally were somewhat less substantial in the vertical aspect as compared to more conventional foreshaft designs, and that would leave them proportionally weaker. So if there is a massive shock near the stern, like say a torpedo or some kind of explosion, etc., then you're going to end up with, well, this happening. Now, at the other end of the ship, <laughs> you have the bow keeps falling off, which is a little bit irritating. Um, this actually occurred on quite a few different ships, but for various reasons, partly just pure happenstance and partly due to reasonably good reporting and survival for that matter um, it's fairly commonly known for US cruisers as you can see here with the Minneapolis. Now the reason for this failure is in some ways similar to the Germans but not quite as not quite the same which is a very unhelpful turn of phrase I know but You'll see what I'm getting at. It's still structural, much in the same way that the German stern failure is is likely down to a structural design flaw. In cru general cruisers' case, and US cruisers in particular, cruisers need to go for speed. And that means they end up with very long, very fine bows that aren't necessarily the widest. Um, you see this in particular on something like, say, a Pensacola, where in fact the lines on the ship are so fine, that's why it has that odd twin uh, lower turret and triple upper turret, because the width of the hull simply isn't wide enough at the point of the first turret to be able to fit the twin turret, uh, a triple turret and its associated magazine, so they had to go for their twin. So... Compared to the rest of the ship, the, as I said, the bow is usually quite long and thin, which in and of itself is weak, uh, therefore against impacts, like the German sterns, except uh, now we're talking about a vertical rather than a horizontal issue. And coupled with that is, ironically enough, actually the all-or-nothing style of armour scheme, because when you have a distributed armour scheme, you have belt armour of some description running almost the full length of the ship whereas with the more advanced all or nothing designs you have a citadel belt which then terminates and tends to terminate at an armoured bulkhead because there's no point in protecting your citadel from the sides if you have uh, an open end which just allows you to be raked like an 18th or 19th century ship of the line um, and this creates an armoured box and quite often there might be a secondary bulkhead of some description between the first two turrets, um, either just for further reinforcement against incoming fire coming from the front, or to separate the two magazines, or for various other reasons. But anyway, so you've got your primary citadel box, and then often where you've got multiple turrets, you might have one or two secondary full-width bulkheads. 
Now that you can probably see is creating an immediate structural issue when it comes to an impact because that box girder that's being formed by the armor uh, belt and the bulkheads is going to be very stiff, very resistant to being warped, whereas the relatively thin and compared to the, re the Citadel relatively insubstantial bow is much easier to damage, much easier to warp, and when it does begin to warp and the armor box of the Citadel stays exactly where it is, that's going to create a huge shearing force, which means if you do take a hit near the bow, it's very likely that bow is going to tear off roughly where the, one of those armored bulkheads actually is. Not helped by the fact that they tended to store relatively interestingly volatile substances <laughs> in the extremities of the ship, um, things like aviation fuel and such, that you couldn't fit into the magazines. So there may be secondary explosions there. But if, 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 effectively, this is the, the reason for the loss of a lot of bows. It's... It's not a particularly substantial structure to begin with relative to the rest of the ship. And when you do hit it, there is effectively, as far as force distribution is concerned, this discontinuity in the hull where one part of the hull is relatively flexible and the next part is very, very stiff. And so that's a natural point to uh, tear away at, which it tended to do. The one bright side of that is that if your bow does break away at... Uh, an armoured bulkhead. Generally, if the bulkhead itself holds, you're still relatively watertight and, well, the Citadel is theoretically designed on most ships to be able to keep you afloat if only it remains buoyant. And this combined with, obviously, the rather heroic damage control efforts in shoring up any gaps and holes that had appeared in the armoured bulkhead explains why a lot of US cruisers in the Pacific campaign would show up back at port looking something like this. Chris Feeney asks, what battle or engagement do you think bean counting, cost savings and budgeting had the most impact on, i.e. changes to armor scheme, engine power, armament, etc.? Well, I'm actually going to give three answers which all typify different aspects of the answer to that question. First, the Battle of the Yalu River. So this was apart from light forces, effectively nine Japanese cruisers versus eight Chinese cruisers and two Chinese battleships. Now, with a lineup like that, you might immediately think, well, it's obvious the Chinese are going to win. And yes, on paper, that's true. However, it turned out to be a very, very decisive victory for the Japanese. And this, as I say, pretty much typifies one of the aspects of your question, because bean counting, cost savings, budgeting and a good healthy degree of corruption had limited the Chinese fleet's training time, <laughs> supply of ammunition, and in the case of corruption, possibly also actually having ammunition, or at least projectiles that were functioning as designed and not filled with esoteric, wonderful compounds like concrete. Um, and so it meant that no matter how well motivated and how much effort specific Chinese crews put in, and to be fair, a fair number of the Chinese crews did their absolute level best, they were crippled by this complete lack of care that had been given to the fleet, and thus the Japanese turned what should have been a one-sided curb stomp against them into a one-sided curb stomp in their own favour. Next up, I'm going to offer up the Battle of the River Plate. Uh, this was Ajax and Achilles plus Exeter versus Graf Spey. And that's because if you look at the way the battle turned out and you look at the forces involved, you realise that you've got two Leander class and a York class up against Graf Spey. Now, what are the Leanders and the Yorks? They are cheap budget alternatives to full-on light and heavy cruisers, respectively. It's not to say they didn't do their level best, and indeed they did indeed win the battle. However, um, Exeter was a little bit of the worst for wear, and Ajax and Achilles did have some issues with the six-inch shells actually, you know, accomplishing anything. Um, now, if you compare that to the sort of full-fat versions of light and heavy cruisers that the British had built, which would be the town class and the county class, respectively, both town and county class are significantly better protected than the Leanders and the Yorks. They are also in possession of a considerably greater armament, the county of course having four twin 8-inch guns and the 
Towns having four triple six inch, in, so 12 guns for them, as opposed to the eight six inch guns on the Leanders and the six eight inch guns on the Exeter. So you're talking about a 33% increase in, 80, in eight inch gun firepower and relative to um, the two Leanders that were present at the time, you're talking about effectively adding a third Leander gun wise. Um, except obviously concentrated within two hulls and thus better fire control. So that's a prime example. I mean, would Graf Spey have gotten away um, into Montevideo if it was faced by two towns and a county instead of two Leanders and a York? Um, it was close enough. It might have been able to, but it might also have been brought down by the sheer weight of fire and the fact that a county is significantly more capable of absorbing damage both through sheer size greater and greater armor as well as a lot more chance to hit back as compared to a york and finally i'm going to say the battle of the denmark strait um you might think oh hang on a minute what are we going with here well it's specifically hms hood and her condition uh, hms hood was in the condition that she was both in terms of not having had her armor improved nor her fire control improved nor her engine and machinery <laughs> replaced etc etc basically she hadn't had her modernization in large part because of the penny pinching budgeting and cost savings that had been imposed by the royal navy in the interwar period by the british government uh, the Royal Navy had wanted to do full-scale modernizations and rebuilds of significantly larger portions of its fleet than it actually managed to get around to, but it was forced to ration out the modernizations because, well, they couldn't afford to do more than they historically did with the money that they were provided, given that they were also, at that point, also expected to be building the King George V's and a whole new generation of cruisers and destroyers. So, yeah if the Royal Navy had been granted a bit more money in the 1930s, or at least for the latter half of the 1930s, then Hood probably would have got its rebuild sooner, which would have meant that either something else would have been in its place, because it might have still been in refit, or it might have been fully refitted as somewhat similar to HMS Renown, and thus the Battle of Denmark Strait might have gone very differently. Reme Lagas, I think. French, not necessarily my strongest topic. Um, he says, I have a rather elaborate question about the Indian Ocean Raid of 1942. On the April 5th, 1942, an albacore from 827 Squadron aboard HMS Indomitable was shot down uh, at around three o'clock in the afternoon by a zero from Admiral Nagumo's carriers before being able to send a detailed sighting report. What if the crew had radioed their discovery and provided Admiral Somerville with enough information to plot the night course to the Japanese fleet, thus allowing the two Royal Navy carriers to launch a night strike? From what I've read, most of the albacores had air-to-surface radar on board, and they had less than 180 miles to cover. But on the other hand, there were relatively few of them, maybe about just over 40. And, well, we're talking about a night strike in 1942. What are the chances of actually accomplishing something useful? Ah oh, yes, the Albacore, <laughs> one of life's great failures, uh, as well as being overtaken in a particularly nasty wind by a destroyer whilst trying to close down on the bis on the turbot, sorry, <laughs> um, and also ending up being replaced by the aircraft that it was supposed to replace, uh, that being the Swordfish. Um, the Albacore didn't have the best run of things, but nevertheless, uh, back to the question. So this was kind of covered um, in another dry dock question that I did about the Indian Ocean Raid and possible alternate ways that could have played out in general. But yes, you're correct. Albacores and earlier swordfish with um, air-to-surface uh, radar were around um, on the Royal Navy carriers for a considerable time um, by 1942, and they had been used previously, which gave the Royal Navy a near enough unprecedented ability to conduct carrier night operations. Of course, you have the attack at Taranto, which was a night operation. And one of the lesser known uh, attacks was actually HMS Victorious's initial attack on Bismarck was also uh, technically a night operation um, and in part guided by the ASV radar carried by aircraft. So... By 1942, although it is still a relatively new tactic, the Royal Navy is 
far from unfamiliar with the idea. Admiral Somerville, being who he is, if he manages to get this report, and bear in mind that Nagumo's force was not concentrated all in one massive uh, group, it was uh, they had the Japanese carriers, as was their operational doctrine, operating in pairs. Um, but assuming this particular Albacore and its location report get through, this is basically what Somerville wants. Um, he, as I mentioned in the question, other question about the Indian Ocean raid that was in another dry dock, he came very close to almost running into the Japanese uh, part of the Japanese fleet anyway. So if he's given this exact uh, data, as I say, this is precisely what he wants. Um, he can start heading towards the estimated Japanese position or a striking launch point uh, in the vicinity of the Japanese po estimated Japanese position um, pretty much as soon as he's sure that there aren't going to be Japanese aircraft coming in for the rest of the day. He can forge ahead. He can then launch his albacores. And the Japanese are not going to see this coming. Um, uh, USS Enterprise, when it started doing nighttime operations for the US Navy, for quite a while remained pretty much the sole US fleet carrier that was capable of these operations. And that was much later than this. Uh, which, and this, in turn, is later than the Royal Navy's already done uh, nighttime carrier strikes on both moving targets at sea and static targets. So, yeah, the, the chances of the Japanese anticipating a bunch of, well, albacores, let me look at them. If you're a Japanese sailor, you're not going to anticipate these World War I rejects come sailing merrily out of the pitch darkness loaded with torpedoes so you're not going to be at action stations, you're not going to have the anti-aircraft gun crews on alert, and, well, to be honest, even if you did, what good is it going to do? You've basically got almost no ability to operate and your anti-aircraft guns at night, short of a few searchlights. Um, and, well, yeah, the one... And they're also, they're also not going to be travelling at particularly full speed, they're going to be at cruising speed, which makes them much easier targets. Now, OK, fair enough, it's night time, which does make them harder to spot but that's what the radar's for and ultimately um if any of the japanese anti-aircraft guns open up it's probably going to do more harm than good because it's going to show the albacores exactly where the japanese aircraft carriers are so obviously with these kind of things you can roll the dice or flip a coin and take the best and worst case solution uh, scenarios i mean worst case the albacores fail to find the Japanese carriers entirely and then also possibly fail to find Somerville's ships and just end up randomly ditching in the Indian Ocean. Best case scenario, the first thing the Japanese knows is when the Japanese Admiral knows is when two of his carriers suddenly start exploding, which is most inconvenient. Middle case scenario, probably if if Somerville plays his cards right, then the Albacores probably launch their strikes and Okay, fair enough. There's only about, let's say, just over 40 of them. But to be honest, Japanese carriers and American carriers were put down by much smaller strike forces of torpedo bombers. So 40-plus aircraft basically launching a surprise attack against completely unprepared Japanese carriers at night. I'm pretty sure those two carriers are going down. And if they're not going down immediately, they're certainly going to be crippled and on fire, which for most Japanese carriers means they're shortly going to explode. Um, but it also would potentially, and this is where it gets a lot more risky for Somerville, but potentially opens up the opportunity for Cape Matapan style operation where, assuming the Japanese carriers don't go down particularly quickly, their escorts and possibly also one or two of the capital ships that were hanging around that being the Congo class might turn up to assist or rescue crews from the Japanese carriers and given that the Japanese night fighting potential which was not insignificant um, would be diminished because it was largely reliant on optical spotting with Mark 1 human eyeball um, it would obviously be diminished by having your night vision ruined because you're right next to the gigantic birding pyre of an aircraft carrier or two and at the end of the day, it probably can't compete with the radar that, again, the British have already used fairly successfully at Matapan. That might then give Somerville a chance to ambush and destroy 
those rescuing forces as well. So potentially putting a Congo or two to, on, uh, to the bottom with 15-inch gunfire from his battleships because, well, we saw how well Kirishima stood up to Washington's 16-inch guns and, uh, well... <laughs> Matapan, if anything, is even more of an execution. Um, so Matapan in the Indian Ocean, uh, yeah, well, chalk up another couple of kills to Warspite, potentially, which would be highly amusing. Um, but there you go. But it, it that does run a certain degree of risk because, of course, uh, as we said, the Japanese ability to night fight is not awful. It's actually quite good. Um, and so if there is something like, say, a random Japanese cruiser or destroyer or two floating off in the darkness that isn't spotted by radar or possibly discounted, then, it, well, if it volleys off a bunch of long lances, those things are hard enough to spot at the best of times, let alone at night. So it would be running a big risk whether or not Somerville would take it for the chance to bag a Congo or two or, poss or other Japanese ships. Well, this scenario didn't happen, so we'll never find out, but it's interesting to speculate. The main thing to bear in mind, even in a sort of a slightly better than even odds prediction scenario, is that even if Somerville takes out a couple of carriers plus um, some escorts and maybe even a couple of Congos, Nagumo still has other carriers in the area, um, and he's going to have a pretty good idea of where Somerville was. Well, by the fact that half his force just went boom. Um, so... Somerville will then have the rather interesting scenario of what exactly do I do with an angry Nagumo who's going to certainly come after me in the morning? Um, can he hightail it out of there in time? Can he hightail it out of there in a direction that Nagumo can't find him? Or is uh, the British fleet about to be on the receiving end of a very angry uh, and vengeful portion of the Kido Butai? And can they defend themselves against it? All these questions and more in an alternate timeline somewhere near you. Fabian Zimmerman asks, If you could time travel and meet Seymour before he messed up at Doggerbank and Jutland, would you try to teach him how to use the signal flags correctly, or would you just shoot him so that BT would be forced to replace him? Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find any actual pictures of Ralph Seymour, so I'm going to go with a picture of HMS Lion, the ship that he spent most of World War I on. Now, this is actually quite the interesting one. I do rag on Seymour and BT, and justifiably so. Um, but at the same time, if I'm time traveling back to before Dogger Bank and Jutland, you've got to remember that, sadly, Seymour, when he was, well, when he took his share of blame and then BT tried to shovel BT's share of blame on Seymour as well after the war, um, took it understandably badly given the impact of what Beatty was trying to foist on him, namely the loss of several thousand lives and the non-favourable outcome of several battles, and he would end up committing suicide in the early 1920s. Now, whilst that is quite tragic, it does say one thing, and that is that Seymour was not a... some he was not an officer who was completely useless knew it and didn't care. He obviously did take at least some of that to heart when people started to call him out on it. Although, as I said, somewhat unfairly because BT tried to make him the sole scapegoat. But that does tell us one other thing, and that is if he took things to heart that much, there's a pretty good chance that if you go back in time and you can tell him before these things happen that look this is what your actions are going to cost it's going to cost the favorable outcome of several large battles to the royal navy it's going to cost thousands of men their lives it's going to cost the royal navy several very large and important ships you probably want to reconsider your position i think seymour is almost certainly going to be an honourable enough man to, assuming that he believes any of this, step aside, uh, whether or not BT wants to keep him on uh, regardless. And if he does, then BT's forced to get another flag officer, um, which, well, hopefully a flag officer who actually has completed his flag training, um, or, alternatively, it might motivate Seymour to 
actually get a bit more practice in on his flag signals so even if he does want to stay with the ship he becomes a better signal officer either of which would be significantly better outcomes for the royal navy so yeah i, d I don't think um shooting him is absolutely necessary because i think he it was an honorable and good enough man that if he was presented with the facts in a believable manner he probably would do the right thing um as i say either get some more training himself or get someone to replace him michelangelo buonarotti buonarotti please correct um asks i've come across a couple of sources that say the french limited their capital ships ranges to a maximum of around 14 kilometers is that true and if so why exactly in world war one this was certainly the case um so even as far as the normandy and Lyon classes the french designers were still putting in ranges on their main armament that were well below what everybody else was capable of doing which is somewhat ironic, actually, given that the, the guns that were designed for the Normandy and Lyon classes were actually capable of extremely long-distance fire if you actually allowed them to elevate. The French just didn't, although later revisions to the Normandy class, when they were considering finishing them after the First World War, did actually involve simple things like increasing the gun's elevation, which allowed it to get a respectable range. Um but the reason for this was in part the design period. You've got to remember the Normandy class started design work in 1911, 1912. Um, so even though uh, they, well, they were never completed and they were only being considered for completion after World War One, they're still of an era of sort of first gen uh, super dreadnoughts edging into maybe second gen. Um, but also the French operational theatre they were mainly thinking about the Mediterranean where they anticipated gun range, uh, ranges in combat being somewhat shorter than was possible in other places but also just the general ethos of where individual nations and navies expected to actually engage varied from nation to nation based partly on their own operational environments and partly on their own operational experience plus a bit of theory thrown in. So the French generally because of the relative lack of very advanced modern fire, fire control equipment in the French and Italian navies, apart from other various other things, um, they were a little bit behind the curve on that during that this period in World War One and the run up to it. Um, they basically didn't think you could accurately hit much beyond the sort of ten to fifteen thousand yard area, and so if you couldn't accurately hit beyond that range why bother elevating your guns to be able to shoot at that range because all you're doing at that point is making your turret design more complicated and making the cutouts in the turrets for the guns to elevate larger which slightly increases the chance of a hit causing um, damage to the turret by bypassing the armament going through that gap so yeah, the, the French overall as a result came out with this idea of an expected battle range that was on the shorter end of the scale um, and the Italians were similar, but not quite as as much. Then if you look at the Germans, the Germans still expected a relatively close decisive uh, battle engagement range, but not as close as the French. The British were expecting to fight slightly longer still, and at the top of the tree were the Americans who expected to fight at exceptionally long range. Given the fire control equipment that was available at the time, by the time World War One rolled around, it turns out that the answer for proper effective battle range was somewhere between the British and German estimations. Um, as you can see at Jutland, where long range fire did score some hits, but both sides would tend to close in to try and start getting hits in and then once one side or the other started to get some serious hits in uh, they would kind of break off and open up the range a little bit more the French as it turned out badly underestimated uh, what effective gun range was going to be and you can probably make a pretty solid argument that the Americans badly overestimated what effective gun range was going to be um, in the World War One and period immediately before and after but again this is in large part reflective of their operational conditions. France is, effect is effectively expecting to fight a close range uh, battle in the environment of the Mediterranean where visibility quite often isn't 
particularly uh, brilliant for long range gunnery, whereas the Americans were doing a lot of practice in large open expanses of car motion like the Pacific, at which point you can understand why long range gunnery might become artificially favoured. ST Rub asks Could the Royal Navy have prevented the invasion of Norway, or were they just spread too thin? Um, well, if you look at the order of battle, it pretty much answers the question for you. Um, the it was it was a serious serious um, tactical error uh, on the British part that they didn't flatten the invasion of Norway uh, in pretty much the same manner that a steamroller would go after a small bag of crisps that had been pinned onto the road. Um, and hyperbole side, I mean, you look at the lineup. You've got on the one side, side you've got Scharnhorst and Eisenhower, um, plus uh, the, you've got three heavy cruisers as well. Um, you've got Blucher, Hipper, and um, Lutzow. You've got four light cruisers, in one of which is Emden, which is uh, somewhat lower down the pecking order when it comes to light cruisers. Um, 14 modern German destroyers and a handful of torpedo boats and lighter craft, plus the invasion force. The Royal Navy and French Navy and um, actually Polish Navy in exile as well deployed to the area at various points during the invasion no less than four full-on battleships, including Rodney, Valiant, and Warspite. Of course, Warspite did its uh, part in taking part about half the German modern destroyer force on its own, um, plus Renown and Repulse. Uh, remember, Renown did end up fighting a running action with Scharnhorst and Neisenau, plus three carriers, Arc Royal, Furious, and, of course, Glorious, which Scharnhorst and Neisenau managed to sink, um, five heavy cruisers, um, only one of which was a York class, being all York itself. Five light cruisers, um, which were of the town class, and so infinitely superior to something like Emden or the Königsberg class. Five smaller light cruisers, uh, six anti-aircraft cruisers, almost 20 destroyers, um, plus o uh, over a dozen submarines, and that's just going for the British. The, the French threw in a couple more cruisers, um, almost another 10 destroyers and um, a submarine. And the Polish showed up as well. They had the Orzel, their, one of their submarines, and three destroyers, uh, Bliskowice, Berza and Grom. They were all around as well. Um, so, yeah, if, if the Royal Navy had had and the French and Polish, I guess, together, had had slightly better intelligence and a bit more force com uh, concentration, and by intelligence I mean as in the signals-spies type, if they'd concentrated even a third of the forces that they actually had to hand and gone after one or more of the German invasion convoys, they would have beaten it, crushed it to a fine powder, collected the powder and put it in a box to soothe the itching later on. Um... If they'd taken half of this, they could have confronted everything that the Germans threw at Norway um, simultaneously and quite comfortably put them to bed. I mean, the Scharnhorst and Neisenau classes are good, don't get me wrong, but um, if you could have put them up against Rodney, Valiant and Warspite, the choice is run away or die. Um, and if you and if you've got Renown and Repulse, you don't even have the runaway portion of things because uh, Renown and Repulse, well, as Renown proved in its uh, action with the two Scharnhorsts, are relatively capable of uh, seeing off the, the two German ships. And those are the biggest German ships they've got. And the Kriegsmarine at this point has put basically everything into this fight. Um, I mean, by the end of the Norway campaign even with the very disjointed nature of the Allied approach to defending it, the Kriegsmarine was reduced to a, a force that basically a single British heavy cruiser squadron uh, with its destroyer escorts could have finished off if they'd chosen to come out to fight between all the various ships that had been lost and the other ships that had been damaged and were in dockyard. So, yeah, forming a couple of battle groups... Um, I mean, yeah, you don't want to go too far off the deep end of, of sort of fantasy land, but uh, 
a fast battle group consisting of, say, the two battle cruisers plus the three aircraft carriers, plus maybe a couple of heavy cruisers and four or five light cruisers, that would be more than capable of taking out by mass mass firepower basically every, anything and everything that the uh, the German is ascending as far as troop convoys are concerned. Again, assuming they've got the intelligence uh, available to locate them, and they can use the crew, the carriers, aircraft as scouts, um, and then you can just rock up with resolution, Rodney, Valiant, War Spite, and the balance of all those cruisers um, to basically give the the, the Scharnhorst and Eisenhower our choice of trying to interfere and dying spectacularly or not, um, assuming that the carriers and the battle cruisers don't get them first. Plus, of course, the Royal Navy submarines did have some fair luck putting torpedoes into the side of various things. So, yeah, um, something of a something of a more coherent um, response, uh, guided by better intelligence and or a little bit of luck, because as we know, that always plays a part. And yeah, that's it, it could well have been game over for the Kriegsmarine before the war really got started, because by yes, they've got Bismarck and Turbitz building and Prince Eugen as well, but they'd effectively be rebuilding the Kriegsmarine from scratch after this, if uh, in this scenario. And we're on to the Patreon questions now. Uh, Primark359 asks, what year is the earliest you could argue the US Navy was stronger than the Royal Navy, and what is the latest year you could make a reasonable argument that the Royal Navy was still stronger than the US Navy? Now, I think I've answered a question similar to this recently, but that question prompted me to do some further thinking. So, well, since it's a Patreon question, I have to answer it anyway. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail. Some people in the comment section of that video mentioned the American Civil War. And yes, America did come out of that with an awful lot of ironclads. But one, they scrapped a lot of them very quickly. And two, they were, shall we say, not exactly power projectors. Most of America's ironclad fleet at the end of the American Civil War was very definitely a coastal force. So the Royal Navy, on the other hand, had by that point a relatively large fleet of ocean-going ironclads. It may not have had quite the same numerically, uh, but comparatively the early to mid-1860s Royal Navy ocean-going ironclads would not have too much of a problem dealing with uh, the American monitors in anything other than very shallow coastal waters. And if the uh, monitors are fighting in those waters, well, then they're not really affecting global trade and everything else. So the Royal Navy will probably be quite happy to leave them there or build a massive fleet of gunboats as they did for the Crimean War. But never mind. Um, so, yeah, it, numerically possibly larger in ironclads at that point, but not stronger as a global power projecting force. Um, now, for when the US Navy becomes stronger than the Royal Navy, there are a few points, as I said before, um, but a lot of it comes down to how you personally or professionally rate or judge things. Um, uh, there, there are some people who will say, oh, well, it, it would be the mid-1920s when the carrier conversions are complete because, let's face it, Lexington and Saratoga are massively superior carriers to even Courageous and Glorious. Entirely fair point. Um, but that's kind of, I think, of a bit of a retroactive, oh, well, carriers are clearly the future. Well, yes, they were the future, but not in the 1920s. A 1920s carrier alpha strike is not going to do that much more than annoy a battle fleet. Um, I mean, fair enough, battle fleet anti-aircraft defences aren't exactly much to write home about either. But um, Billy Mitchell's fantasies aside, no. Um, so during the 1920s, a lot of it basically comes down to how you rate the two navies' battle lines. And that is obviously quite the interesting thing because the US Navy on the one hand has a battle line almost entirely made up of standard class um the Royal Navy has a battle line that's made up of ships that have individually larger and heavier hitting guns but the average Royal Navy battle line unit is a Revenge or Queen Elizabeth class which has eight 15 inch guns whereas the average US Navy standard has 12 14 inch and there's a whole 
section of argument and debate to go on in in their sort of weight of broadside number of shells um, relative speed because none of the u.s ships are capable of much more than 21 um, knots whereas well even at, the, at that point in the early 1920s even the r's are capable of a bit more than that the queen elizabeth's a bit more still and of course the battle cruisers faster still not including all the old stuff that was basically waiting to be scrapped however um thanks to congress the u.s navy in the 1920s did have vast swarms of destroyers but so did the royal navy but what they lacked were cruisers they had just built the omahas which are yeah, um and they were obviously in the process of building the pensacolas um and eventually the northamptons but the Royal Navy, I think, had undeniable numerical and, to a large degree, qualitative uh, cruiser superiority, with the exception, probably, of the Pensacolas, just because of their, at the time, ridiculous armament, compared to the heaviest British cruiser, which would have been the Hawkins. So that leads us through into the 1930s, and in the 1930s, there is a certain argument to be made because now aircraft capacity is and capability is improving so they are actually a threat albeit i still maintain that aircraft carriers were probably not a threat to an organized battle line force until pretty much a few months maybe a year or so before uh pearl harbor it would that's near enough the turning point when aircraft really start to become a major threat in terms of both numbers and capability so the carrier part, especially with obviously the Royal Navy's building new carriers, the Americans building new carriers, is kind of all a little bit of a wash at that point. But there is a certain argument to be made in the 1930s that the cruiser balance shifts relatively decisively in the US Navy's favour because they start coming up with the Brooklyn class and the New Orleans class and the related other classes and things like the one-off USS Wichita. And they come up with those in relatively large numbers relatively quickly, and especially in the heavy cruiser department, they have quite a lot. Now, the Royal Navy has more cruisers, but I don't think anyone can argue with a straight face that a Leander or, heaven forbid, an Arethusa is going to beat a Brooklyn in a stand-up fight. Uh, now, maybe maybe a town class can, but there's nowhere near as many town class in the um, mid, mid to late 1930s as there are compared to the American light -like cruiser designs. And, well, the Royal Navy builds the counties, well, and York and Exeter, um, whereas obviously the American Navy starts off with the New Orleans class and um, already has the Pensacolas and the Northamptons and goes on from there. So... In terms of individual cruisers, and more specifically battle line cruisers, you can make a fairly good argument to say that the cruiser balance swings the US Navy's way towards the latter part of the 1930s. Destroyers, um, by and large, it's neither here nor there. The American destroyer arm is, generally speaking, more heavily armed, but they continue to have serious issues with things like stability um, and usability up until, well, shockingly enough and this will come as little surprise to most of you the Fletchers but that gets into World War II um, and the battle line units well they're, they're basically unchanged you've got the North Carolinas and the King George V's both building but they're not really a factor in the majority of the 1930s because they're not complete yet however you then have World War II and in the first couple of years of World War II, the Royal Navy loses a fair number of ships. Obviously, uh, it loses Courageous very early on. It loses Royal Oak very early on. Um, and Glorious not that much longer thereafter. And then you've got Barham, Hood and Ark Royal, which are all lost in 1941. Plus, obviously, numerous cruisers, destroyers, etc., etc. So you can make a perfectly legitimate argument that the US Navy in 1941 is definitively stronger than the Royal Navy because although the Royal Navy is building uh, replacements for the losses they're not building them that quickly um, and especially the major battle line units or fleet carriers battleships etc 
So the losses of war in 39 and 40 and 41 definitely make the Royal Navy at that point, at least on paper, weaker than the US Navy. But then, of course, Pearl Harbor comes along um, and the suddenly the US Navy's battle line is uh, rather significantly reduced. Um, and in the subsequent engagements during 1942, the US Navy is reduced even further because during that period, they lo lose pretty much almost all of their pre-war carrier lineup. And although the Royal Navy does continue to lose uh, ships like, say, HMS Eagle, Hermes, Prince of Wales, Repulse, etc., um, although they do lose these ships after uh, Pearl Harbor, it doesn't quite compare to getting most of uh, the Pacific Fleet's battle line knocked out. And especially in carrier terms, which obviously now are becoming more and more the arbiters of uh, sea warfare, by the end of uh, that period, the Royal Navy is loaning the US carrier a navy because the US only has one oper fully operational fleet carrier at that point. So, although you say you can make a perfectly legitimate argument the US Navy is stronger in 1941, it's also equally legitimate to say that the Royal Navy is by far the strongest in terms of its its major capital line units and such like in 1942 and to be honest even into 1943 um, once you start to get into further into 1943 then things start to change again uh, because during that point you have the first of the Essex swarm to start to show up um, the South Dakota class as a class starts to come fully online and deploy they begin to solve they pretty much solve the problems as much as they can on north carolina and washington and so on and so forth so the u.s navy starts to build itself back up in strength um obviously the royal navy is continuing to expand at this point but well it's the world war ii u.s industry it's a meme for a reason so yeah at some point in 43 that's when the relative balance of power i think shifts overall and that's pretty much it at that point um after after that you can make arguments in certain sectors of naval warfare more to do with experience than sheer numbers but that's probably the last time sort of mid 43 that you can make a reasonable argument that the royal navy is on paper at least stronger than the u.s navy qualitatively that's a, that's a whole other argument and well both sides have equally leg legitimate claims on that so let's not go into that miko Leitnan asks a uh, slight addition to my previous question um if the combined fleet intercepting the doolittle raid is replaced with the kido butai intercepting the doolittle raid what happens also how do the typical career path of an age of sail sailor non-commissioned officer and officer go so, of course, uh, questions in reverse order. The various career paths, well, the Royal Navy career path system <laughs> in the Age of Sail, which I suppose is probably the, the best example, um, as it's the most widely sourced, is labyrinthine, to say the least. But broadly speaking, uh, a sailor and a non-commissioned or pet in the Royal Navy petty officer kind of, but they're not quite interchangeable, but you could advance from one to the other. So if you're a sailor, you would aspire to the rank of able seaman, which means that you basically know what you're doing. Um, once you got to that level, usually that's where most sailors would stay, um, pretty much for their entire career. Um, however, if you were possessed of a certain amount of technical skill, um, one way or the other, whether as, as a gunner, as a... Uh, someone who manned the sails and the rigging or as a navigator or something along those lines or ge generally just a leader of men you could move into the ranks of the petty officers now the petty officers uh there were obviously a lot of varying specialities in that with some of which we've just covered and these would make up uh you could advance through this uh quite a lot because the one thing you've got to remember at the age of sail especially in a navy the size of the royal navy is that simply being of a rank didn't necessarily make you equal with everyone else of that rank um going slightly higher up the chain for example um someone who's the captain of a frigate would not be held to be the same 
level of seniority as someone who was the captain of a first-rate ship of the line. Uh, the captain of the frigate would almost always defer to the captain of the larger vessel. And similarly, if you were a petty officer, if you were a gunner on a fifth rate and you came across a, a gunnery master from a first or second rate, chances are they would probably consider themselves to be your superior, even if only just. The ranking up of the NCOs, uh, of the petty officers, was actually one of the few places where you could see a, some degree of advancement and or career security because there were there were three positions aboard a ship of the line which were known as standing officers and those petty officers would receive pay regardless of where the ship was if it was in service obviously everyone got paid but when a ship paid off into reserve into refit or into ordinary then everyone else in the crew was dismissed including the actual commissioned and warrant officers and if they couldn't find service on another ship, then they'd either not be paid at all, or they'd go on half pay for some of the more senior officers. Whereas the standing officers, um, those particular three, you would be paid regardless, because you would be kept with the ship, or near the ship, um, just to keep it running and to form the experienced core if the ship was then brought back into service. So that was a good place to be, especially um, for someone who could work their way up the ranks. The other one is you could become a sailing master, and if you were the sailing master, that's pretty much as high a rank of, of a petty officer as you could get, because you'd have a lot more experience and practical day-to-day -day, um, seniority over quite a number of the actual commission and warrant officers. Obviously, socially speaking, and uh, depending on the ship, they they can still legally countermand you, because they are officers and you are not a commissioned or warrant officer, but... It would be a very foolish midshipman who would try and countermand the word of a sail sailing master who was maybe three times his age. Um, and then when you've got the officer ranks, um, you've got the warrant officers who studied and got their uh, their qualifications, their ranks by, as it might suggest, a warrant uh, paper. And then you have the commissioned officers who are commissioned by the Crown. And to get to become a commissioned officer, to become a lieutenant, you have to still receive a commission, even if you are already a warrant officer. Now, the rise from midshipman to lieutenant and so on and so forth up to uh, post captain and then full captain, that much could be relatively rapid if you were well connected or particularly skilled. Um, but once you reached the rank of captain, it was a slow grind of who is the most senior and that was again i mean you could make certain you could make certain headway if you were very well connected or very rich which often go together but generally speaking it was a case of wait for the older ones to die um <laughs> which was why in times of peace you could have basically almost zero advancement um whereas in times of war, times of war were very popular because times of war tended to lead to the enforced retirement of quite a number of high-ranking officers, whether that was because the Royal Navy, or I suppose any Navy, um, broadening it out to the whole age of sail, would either come up to them and go, you know, well, yes, we appreciate that you're the oldest officer in the fleet. However, Admiral, you are also the oldest officer in the fleet, and chances are if we put you aboard a ship and send you out to sea, you'll break. So please retire and accept this generous retirement package and let someone else take over the rank. Um, and then you have the more prosaic enforced forms of retirement that usually come in the shape of uh, 32-pounder cannonballs travelling at high velocity, um, which were not very popular with the person who was forcibly retired by said cannonball, but were very, very popular with all the other officers who could now compete for his uh, rank and position. Um, tropical ventures as well were generally looked upon with great favour by those who didn't have to go on them because of the uh, propensity of large numbers of people to die of tropical diseases, which again was a very easy way of opening up the ranks for um, commissioned officers who really, really didn't want to be a lieutenant their entire career. Now, as far as what happens if the Kido Butai intercepts the Doolittle Raid, um, lots of screaming, lots of burning, and then silence, I think. Um, if the full force of the Kido Butai that's available at the time of the Doolittle Raid somehow 
isn't where they historically were and instead winds up chasing off the Doolittle raid, it's game over. Um, even if the B-25s on Hornet are launched in a somewhat bizarre and spectacular uh, assault on the Kido Butai, the simple fact of the matter is it's it's two carriers being intercepted therefore caught out by um and thus keto butai getting the first strike in by a significantly larger fleet now of course you do have the situation where you can sort of counter argue things somewhere like midway where yes the u.s fleet was outnumbered however that is as much an intelligence success as it is a naval success and in this case well it's the keto butai's intelligence coup because uh, they're the ones doing the intercepting. So yeah, if they're if the uh, Enterprise and Hornet are caught by surprise, they'd be very very lucky to survive at that point, because um, the Japanese can hit them and keep on hitting them because the the US ships need to run because if they don't run, well the Kido Butai comes with escorts and that's that's going to end badly, especially if the uh, Japanese fleet the japanese aircraft are going to be able to go oh yeah by the way these two carriers minimal to no protection maybe we should send some fast ships after them as well um so yeah nightmare scenario for the usn at that point and so i thought i'd stick this section in at the end um you might have noticed the video goes on a bit more um because when i put sort of comments corrections etc in the uh, channel admin bit at the beginning i realized i cut off sort of five to ten minutes of question answering time whereas this way uh, the channel admin's brief at the beginning and then we get as many questions as we can within our regular hour so um a few well corrections and comments so a few people pointed out when uh talking about whether or not a another nation could operate a second-hand u.s carrier quite a few pointed out india as a relatively large navy um, that might well be able to operate a US supercarrier if they somehow got their hands on a second-hand one. And whilst, yes, I would agree that operation, op operation? operating a conventional carrier, well, one of the, I think, one or two that the US Navy actually still has that haven't turned into razor blades, would probably be entirely within the realm of possibility for the Indian Navy, given that they have operated and continue to operate a fair number of, of medium carriers uh, for throughout most of their history. Operating a full nuclear-powered carrier? I mean, they do have nuclear-powered vessels, but on the other hand, the Indian Navy does have a distressing habit of, um, well, setting fire to submarines that belong to them um, and accidentally causing flooding on one of the two currently operational nuclear submarines and well yeah things like that mean that given that their experience with nuclear power is confined to relatively recently whilst crew wise and perhaps even flight operations wise they could operate a uh, super carrier I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable just yet giving them the keys to something with uh, a couple of large nuclear reactors on board, to be perfectly honest. Um, give it another five or ten years, and yes, um, up until that point, if you really did want to give them a, an old Nimitz or something, uh, put me in another ocean, if you don't mind. And, uh, well, of all the things in the damage control video... The the one thing that required a little bit of damage control on my part was actually effectively just a passing comment about the flyover states. And, uh, well, it turns out there are a fair number of you who, uh, well, live in what are somewhat unkindly termed the flyover states and were very, very quick to point out to me that um, implying that people who live in those states are somehow would somehow be less technologically advanced was probably not an entirely accurate to say the least now i do understand and i appreciate well there's enough of you and i'm gonna i'm gonna put my hands up and say look i'm a naval person the precise history of the mechanization of midwest america is not my field of expertise so if there seems to be a large body of you lot saying actually that's that we, we were a bit more technically sophisticated than you give us credit for fine i uh, if i made that mistake i made that mistake um all i will say not necessarily as, a de as by way of defense but by way of explanation is the the reason i chose that particular area to try and 
basically I was trying to illustrate the point that you may end up with a crew that was drawn from an a, a part of America, shall we say, that was perhaps less technologically sophisticated than the engineering se sector of Tokyo, for example, um, was a newspaper article that I came across while I was doing um, research, trying to find out, is there any way that I could legitimately make this point about? And that newspaper article was from an American newspaper dated in from 1928, which was lamenting that outside of the coastal cities and what well what today is called the Rust Belt, but obviously back then wasn't. So, um, it was basically saying, well, outside of these areas, this whole sort of mechanization and and modern technology thing isn't really spreading that much into into these other more rural states and you know standard op-ed piece um basically effectively i suppose at that point it was probably just going ha ha look at the backward yokels which actually now that you say think about it probably should have been a bit of a clue as to where that author was based but never mind um but based on that reading i kind of went oh okay so maybe mechanization in the sort of the the midwest farming areas of america is not quite as advanced as mechanization in the cities and the industrial heartlands and thus i made an assumption and well as i say i got it wrong um thank you for correcting me um <laughs> and and i shall never make the mistake of assuming that that uh, the average american farmer of the late 20s and early 30s was n less uh, mechanically minded than his counterparts in other parts of the states um lest the wrath of many of you descend on me once more now the next thing on the agenda um is the armored cruiser design competition uh, that was announced way back before christmas and uh, well it took a little while <laughs> for me to get round to um with the help of uh, a couple of very kind discord uh, members for getting some judging going so the finalists and i ended up looking through all the entries and picked out well we we picked out four finalists and of those finalists i think there is, there is a definite winner in my mind um but the other three i think were definitely all worthy as well so the finalists in no particular order were the augusto or augusto uh, which was an italian armored cruiser that very much took cunaberti's ideas and ran and ran and ran with them it was, a, it was an armored cruiser armed almost entirely with 10 inch guns which was quite impressive although in true italian style was um its armor was mm, yeah maybe um then you have the i think hrothgar uh, a danish armored cruiser now it wasn't quite as uh, combat capable as some as the other finalists however it was very well designed for the requirements of denmark um, so this this is the, the whole thing about designing to the nation that you're building for it's like okay yeah fair enough the augusto augusto has ridiculously more guns um heavy guns than hrothgar but hrothgar is very realistic for what denmark would have produced so points there definitely you then have uh, the wolf with an e uh, because this is a well a british built product for the royal canadian navy um and this has certain shades of the minotaur class to it but um addresses a number of uh, the concerns that arose from the last two pairs of uh, last two classes of royal navy armor cruiser and finally the other finalist was the dunami uh, dunamis i think uh, a greek armored cruiser which uh, sort of took up the the kind of mantle of the Georgius Averoff in terms of its uh, its design styling. So those were the the four finalists. Of those, in this particular case, I'm going to choose the Wolf as the overall winner. So if you are the designer of the Wolf, um, please do get in contact, and we shall sort you out with the primary prize. But uh, the designers of Augusto, Hrothgar, and Dunamis, um, also you shall also receive a prize albeit a slightly smaller one so please also get in contact with me the other entries we had were uh, two british uh, and other entries the broke and the sir gawain um three american entries the austin enterprise and gettysburg and an argentinian entry the eton so there will be a pdf file made available on the discord server 
for those of you who want to look at the statistics, explanations, and uh, review comments. And yeah, so that wraps up that competition. Thank you very much for entering. And just a reminder that of the Treaty Cruiser design competition, um, a few of you have asked the question and I did forget to mention it with previously. This is a Spring Sharp design competition using the, the last or latest available version of Spring Sharp. So um, that is the, the, the method of entry. And I will finally this month, hopefully get round to doing a how to Spring Sharp video so that we're, the, this you know, the treaty cruiser competition will run hopefully um long enough for people to absorb the lessons from that if you are indeed a spring sharp newbie um or you've never used it before so yeah those of you who are very experienced with spring sharp you can probably just skip that one because <laughs> um, i'm sure you've probably forgotten more than i will ever know with that thing uh, but anyway okay so that is all of that with one more exception and that exception is apology. And that apology is extended to the designer of this rather wonderful unit. This is a French battlecruiser from the battlecruiser design competition uh, way back in the middle of last year. Um, this is the Lamont Piquet, a French battlecruiser. And I did ask as one of the finalists for them to write in um, to contact me. And well, if you've seen the 100k subscriber um, winners video, you'll know that I had some interesting issues uh, the last weekend trying to persuade my ISP that no, I was not involved, in fact, involved in the white slave market, amongst other things. Um, but that uh, occasioned me to clear out the spam folder of the various bits and pieces. And what did I find in there? Right at the back, a response. That's been sitting in there for a while. So my deepest apologies to the poor old designer of Lamo Piquet. Um, I've, I can't really make an excuse. I should have checked my spam folder earlier, but there you go. Um, so in the interest of apology, please do get in contact with me again if you're still watching and you haven't been completely put off by my complete lack of response up till this point. Um, and I will also now regale you with the capabilities and history of the Lamo Piquet class of battlecruisers um, from that competition. So let's get on with that. So, so these ships are of a just under 19,000 ton uh, standard displacement, just over 19,000 ton at normal. They use the 305 millimeter guns that are found on the Danton class and they have refrigerated magazines um, to keep them their uh, ammunition nice and cool, which is actually an important factor after the Ayena decided it was going to jump 40 feet in the air and scatter itself to the four winds. The turrets, as you can see, are laid out all on the centre line. And one of the reasons this was judged fairly highly was all this, all the armament was spot on historicals you've got the danton glass guns you've got a 65 millimeter secondary battery that's uh, picked off of the armored cruisers and french battleships of the period so exactly right for something that's straddling the line between the two um and in this particular case the french decided to bite the bullet and buy parsons turbines for it when it was constructed so <laughs> it's capable of a fair turn of speed it's 26 and a half knots um its uh, armor is relatively thin at uh, just over six inches but hey this is uh, for the time period that's designed that's not any worse than the invincibles um and so the design history uh, and service history etc um i will now read to you with the appearance of HMS Invincible and the all-big gun battlecruiser, the French Marine Nationale realised that the freshly ordered armoured cruisers of the Edgar Quinet class were, at a stroke, made obsolete. The Marine Nationale therefore commissioned a new battlecruiser design as a follow-up to the Edgar Quinet class. The new battlecruisers, named La Mont Piquet and De Grasse, were reordered in 1908, but neither were completed until 1912, given the penchant of the French designers and administrators to tinker with things, slowing the construction of ships down significantly. Their service in World War I would likely be limited, given France's commitments to police the Mediterranean and watch Austria-Hungary, whilst the Royal Navy concentrated elsewhere. 
the Edgar Kidé historically participated in the hunt for the Goban in August 1914. Given the size and power of La Piquet and de Grasse, the two ships probably would have been deployed in the pursuit. Given the thinner armour and the size disparity, La Piquet would likely not fare well against the German battlecruiser in a single ship duel, but the Goban would not be able to outrun La Piquet and would almost certainly feel the pain from any engagement. If the two battlecruisers stayed together and encountered Goban, however, I would rate their chances of victory as excellent. Not to mention, obviously, the Invincibles would be piling up behind. Um, after the hunt for the Goban, the ships, if they weren't damaged in combat, would almost certainly have featured in the mid-August Allied thrust into the Adriatic Sea under Admiral Boué de Lampirier, I think, uh, a campaign which culminated in the successful Battle of Antivari. The remainder of the war would likely be spent in coastal raids along the Adriatic, with relatively little to show for their efforts. So there you have it, a potted history of a French battlecruiser that never was, by partial means of apology, and as I say, if you are still listening out there, um, oh, designer of Lamo Piquet, please write in, and I promise I've added you to the definitely not spam list. And with that... This slightly extended version of The Dry Dock is brought to a close. Thank you very, very much for listening, and I hope to see you again in another video soon.